So I'm not going to talk a lot about myself. I'm going to rather spend the time really talking about soils. We can talk about myself later on if you so wish, but um, let's move on through here. All right, it's quiz time. I want each one of you to think of a farm you know well, whether it's one you own or one that you know of. Think about that farm and tell me in 2016 how much soil loss did you have last year? Everybody got that number right on top of your head? Okay, let's take a poll. How many of you thought the soil loss on that farm was less than a quarter ton per acre last year? Nobody? How about quarter to one ton? Okay, getting a few hands. One to three. A few more. Three to six. How about greater than six? I asked this question at a national ag data conference over in Iowa City. 90 plus percent of the people said they were in this range. What's the state average soil loss for Iowa? Anybody know? 5.8 and increasing. So when people tell me that a high percent of the people tell me they're in this range, I have to wonder, do we really know? And that's what I want to talk to you about here. Right here, our greatest asset. I think Jerry did a great job this morning of summing up why taking care of our soil is important for yield, especially with the variability in weather that we have. But then also, as Neil pointed out, we really have the water quality issues that we need to deal with too. A lot of people don't think of it this way, but 160 acres of cropland in the Midwest, it's like having a $1.5 million beach home. Think about that. If you have a $1.5 million beach home, it's an asset, what do you do to make sure that asset lasts for generations? What do you do to that house to keep it in good shape? Go ahead, don't be shy, throw up. Make sure the roof's good, siding, foundation, windows, doors, you take care of it, right? You don't lease it. <laughs> ah, I'm not going there. You asked it. So, what about that 160 acres? What do you do to make sure that it is well taken care of? Real quick, we're going to diverge here for a second. The topsoil that we have took thousands of years to form. We've already lost about half of it and a few generations of farming. So let's see, we're supposed to feed how many billion of people? We've lost half of our topsoil, and I would argue it's the best half, it's the top part. Our average loss is probably about 25 times the rate of formation. And that's probably being optimistic. And we're sending those assets down the stream. Not a very rosy picture to paint, right? I think of our farm fields kind of like, the, the residue on our farm fields kind of like copper shingles. And I, here's an analogy that I can think through in my mind. So we're trying to improve yields and we're going out there tilling, we're trying to warm that soil up, and yes, we can get that crop up and growing faster, but I think Jerry talked about some of the negatives. What if on that beach home you needed some cash that year, so you went out and pulled some shingles off, and let's say those shingles are worth 500 bucks a piece. Would you go out to your house, pull off a couple dozen shingles, and sell them because you needed short-term money? Anybody? Nobody? We don't really think of it that way. When we think about pulling that residue off the soil, as an analogy, we're doing something to pull, like pulling shingles off the house. We're threatening that long-term structure. And we all know that once the roof goes, the building goes. You can drive around the countryside. Barns are a very good example. A barn can stand about forever until the roof goes. Once the roof goes, the barn goes. 
And as Jerry pointed out again, there's a lot of similarities that if we're not taking care of that, that organic matter, our residue, our carbon, the structure goes. And next slide. So residues really are like the shingles of the crop. So this is an example farm. My farm lays across the hill, right, like over here. What is this area in here? Dried out grain. It's brown when all the area around it, green. That's the giving up the yield. My guess is these areas here have not been productive for the last 10 to 20 years. And they probably won't. It's pretty thin soil, pretty eroded. It's going to be tough to get a good crop off that unless we have really good rain all year long. North Central Iowa. So I'm still waiting for Jerry to get me some information, but what he is looking at is satellite imagery. And what he's finding is these knobs in North Central Iowa, where we don't have erosion, those knobs have increased by about a factor of three or four. Those are the clarion knobs that, you know, they're more gravelly and they're not really producing much yield. They're probably burned up on uh, drier years. Now instead of having, as an example, one acre, now they're three or four acres. So we're trying to bring yield up across this whole field, and yet we have these poor spots in the field that are getting bigger. And it's more of a challenge. I see this every year around Carroll. I can drive within 30 miles of my house any year, and I can get pictures like this year after year. We have all this nice sediment down here in the bottom. Where do we need that sediment? Back where it came from. We need it up here on the hills, keeping them productive keeping our yields up. We don't need more sediment in the bottom. We already have really deep topsoil down here. We don't need more. So working with some Iowa State University people, Rick, I won't mention your name, but <laughs> some of the information that we've come up with is we have given up a billion dollars per year because of erosion. That's economic development. So I have to put it in farmer terms so I can think about it. How much is a billion? I've never seen a billion. 1,000 new combines, 2,000 new tractors every year in the state of Iowa alone. The, the machinery companies would have a heyday. They'd think they'd died and gone to heaven if they could sell that many more new pieces of equipment every year. Let's take it down to a local level. Let's bring it down to your farm. Roughly, we have given up about 15 bushel per acre per year. On a year like this, that might be the difference between profit and loss. I would uh, submit to say there's not a farmer in Iowa who would not like to see another 15 bushel an acre on their farm. What happens if I pull into somebody's farm with this rig and say, you know what, I just want to take off the top inch of soil. Can I do that? Well, here's my line. <laughs> I'm not going there. <laughs> no, the farmers would meet me with a gun and like, no, get off my farm. They know the value of it. The problem with soil erosion is most of it goes unseen. It's a gradual process. It's that slow movement down the hill. This is not the erosion you can drive by at 60 miles an hour and see a little gully coming down the hillside. This is that sheet erosion, that slow movement down the hill. And it goes unseen. So I think this is really the summary here is if you want every acre to work its hardest every year, you need to make sure that you keep that acre healthy. And you heard this earlier this morning. This is nothing new. And I mentioned this. We're losing about 5.8 ton per acre per year, and it's increasing. Sadly, this number 
is only she and rail. It does not include those little ephemeral gullies that you see each year. And as we get our more intense rainfalls, those become a bigger part of the picture. In fact, with ephemeral erosion and tillage erosion, we might be close to double that number. So what rate is tolerable? I might have mentioned this earlier. None is really tolerable. But under best case scenarios, let's say that with a cropping system you can gain about a quarter ton per acre per year. And we're losing 5.8 or maybe, maybe double that. Not anywhere close to sustainable. I want to talk real quick about a tool that I'm working with, a couple of the uh, farm managers with. There's uh, two here today. Um, so I'm working with Greg Townsend of uh, Farmland Stewardship Solutions. I'm also working with Peoples. And working with uh, the landowners to run soil calculators so they know what's happening on their farm. And I'll run through this real quick, but it's really just taking a look at their field. Picking a couple rotations, so in this rotation, this is like a corn bean rotation, and it's your typical tillage that is done, I would say, in like north central Iowa. And then I also looked at another one of, well, what if we were to no-till one year, and then what if we no-tilled and threw in cover crops? So let's take a look and see what it tells on this field. Every field will be different. Field average on this is 5.46. As we go to no-till one year, we drop that to 4.78. No-till cover crops, 0.22. What can the soil regenerate? Quarter ton. We're there. Now, let's take a look at the 20% of the farm that's the most erodible. 20% is losing 13 tons. So while we're trying to improve productivity, we have 20% of that farm losing 13 tons. One year no-till, 11 ton. No-till cover crops, still 0.34. Let's put that in inches. What's a ton? As much as I've worked in this arena, I still cannot visualize a ton of soil. So I need to think in terms of inches. On this 20% most erodible, in 10 years, we're losing 85 hundredths of an inch. So let's say that you are a farmer and you farm a piece of ground for 40 years. Three plus inches. What is your legacy? When you turn this over to your children, you're going to have three inches less of soil on 20% of the farm. When I think in terms of that, that scares me. And you can see the other numbers. I'm not going to spend time going through each one of them. Economics. When you lose that topsoil, we're losing that yield potential. I think we've covered that well enough this morning. I don't need to dwell on that. There's also nutrients attached to, those, to the soil. So as we're losing that soil, we're losing nutrients, we're losing productivity. On an alternative one, what was that, 50-some acre farm we were looking at? I'd have to go back and look. But something like that, we're giving up about 13,000. Under alternative two, we're dropping it down to about 11,000. No-till and cover crops, about 506. So I think this is some of the information we can begin to use to see how we can pay for cover crops. And I'm throwing cover crops out as one option. It's a good option. It is not a silver bullet. There's problems with cover crops just as there is with no-till, just as there is with terraces. Any, name any practice. It's not perfect, but it's really trying to understand the management of that practice, implementing it, and continuing to learn on how to do better with that system. So this is the uh, picture, putting it in, black, in, in, in color. So think of this almost like a yield map. In fact, y laying yield maps over the top of these is very interesting. There's a pretty good correlation between the high erosion areas, which are like, you know, the red, to low yield. 
pretty good correlation as, as we would expect. So as we move to less tillage, we're taking away some of the red and converting it to yellow, some of the yellow to green. I'm not really hung up on whether somebody no-tills or covert crops or whatever. What we want to do is take these bars and move them this way, whether that's through rotation change, whether it's through less tillage, whether it's through structural practice, cover crop, no-till, whatever. How can we move the bar from here to there? That's the important part. And that's the nice thing about soil calculator. A farmer can say, well, I've been thinking about doing X. What do I do? Well, let's look and see what that comes out. And we can show them what the answer is on their farm. This isn't always the most popular slide when I show it. <laughs> but there, there's been a lot of discussion, a lot of cussing about Des Moines Waterworks and the whole lawsuit. And yet, when I flew over this river here a little over a year ago, and I was looking at the color of the water, I was thinking, hmm, maybe there was a reason. But out of sight, out of mind, it's off my farm, right? I would contend, and this goes back to the days when I used to work for NRCS, you would go out and a farmer would say, look what that neighbor is dumping on my property. They were not very pleased with the neighbor, what they were dumping on their property. And I always wanted to take them to the lower side of their property and say, let's look what you're dumping on your neighbor. But that's not what we see. We care about our property and what's coming on to it. When it comes to what's leaving our property, not everybody does a real good job of looking at that. I'll make sure we've got some time for questions too. We've got about 10 minutes. You got it. So this is where I'm going to end up. It's your asset, your choice. What do you want to leave? So questions? Yes? In order to know what percent acres would you estimate have these uh, practices being implemented on them, cover crops, no-till, reduced till? I am probably not the best person to answer that, but selling cover crops, strip till, no-till in north central Iowa is a long day. It's uh, not one of those, none of those practices are heavily adopted. Mainly they're looking at really good soils, deep soils, losing half an inch or an inch. is not the same impact as if you are in, say, southern Iowa or Kansas, Nebraska, whatever. And I'm not saying it's not important, but I think it's easy to overlook that. For them it's more of, I want that soil black so in the spring it warms up and dries out. And so it becomes more of a challenge to look at conservation practices. Yes? Do you have any estimates on loss of organic matter through tillage and oxidation you know, in addition to erosion, you know, physical removal? I would have to let the scientists answer that one. But we know it happens. I mean, as Jerry said, you cannot build organic matter by tilling. You are going to lose. There is no doubt if you till, we're going to lose from exactly what you said, the oxidation process. Yes? What is land of lakes sustain? What is land of lakes sustain? So, years ago, I was working for Agrin, and we developed some planning tools for soil and water management. And United Suppliers out of Ames and Eldora had licensed the software. And it's soil calculator and some of the other tools. Uh, the reason they did is they wanted to start a sustained program. And it's really about working with our owners. So we're a cooperative made up of retailers. Uh, now that I'm with Land Lakes, it's also our dairy members who are our owners. So it's really working with them to improve efficiencies. Uh, one of the biggest, fastest gains we think we can make is the nitrogen management. So 
If we apply, I'm not going to get too deep into the nitrogen. I can get lost pretty fast on this. But roughly, if you apply anhydrous in the fall with no stabilizer, we're probably losing about 50% of that nitrogen. If you are GM or pick any company and 50% of your production coming in is wasted, not very efficient. So what if we can start adding stabilizers? What if we can split apply? What if we can put that nitrogen on closer to when the crop can take it up? That's a win. It's a win for everybody. There is not a, I, th I think that's where we can all unite, whether you're a food group and a consumer, a farmer, anybody, you can unite is nobody wake, no farmer wakes up and says, man, I hope we get a six inch rain and I lose all my nitrogen. I hope it goes down to the morning. Nobody wants that. So I think this is one of the places where we can really unite is around sustain is we want to improve efficiencies, we want to do a better job. As they were working on that, Agron approached them with the conservation planning tools and then they were like, wow, now we have a package that's more robust than just the four R's. This tells the whole story. So the, um, the CEO, well, the person in, in uh, United Suppliers, Matt Carsons, he stood on stage with Walmart and he promised them, I want to say something like, 10 million acres of sustainably grown crops by 2020. The CEO of Land O'Lakes was not overly pleased that this little company in Iowa was on stage with Walmart and they were not. Well, merger talks then happened and it wasn't because of that. But merger talks did happen, and when the merger began, it's still not complete. It still won't be complete until October. But the CEO up in Land O'Lakes is like, I want the sustain team, and I want them now, and I want them up here. So they put together the sustain team. So it's really working. It's really tying that link between the food groups and the farmers. Land O'Lakes is actually a food company with the butter. But we also reach to the farmer through our ag retailers and our dairy members. So it's really trying to improve the efficiencies of farming, make it more sustainable. Yes? Uh, Stan, you used the word sustainable a few times in here. And I've tried to get that out of my vocabulary because I think it's, uh, I think it's an obsolete word. Uh, at what point will we start talking about regenerative? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, that's a hard one. Uh, when you think of sustainable, it really does have a different meaning to everybody. I don't see sustainability as a destination. I don't ever see it as a destination. It is a journey. It's that continual improvement. So, again, I go back to my NRCS days, and what I see is we're trying to take farmers and improve them which has given us the biggest bang for the buck? Taking that, let's say, the poorest actor out there and getting him to move forward, or taking some of those people who are like helping the agencies understand soil quality. And there's some farmers doing that. They're probably way ahead of some of us. If I take that farmer and improve him a little bit, my gains are really not that big. So when I say sustainability, it's really a journey of helping farmers make that continual improvement. I do like the terms regenerative. Regenerative is difficult. I mean, just from a soil erosion standpoint, trying to stay under 0.25 ton per acre per year, even that 20% we looked at on, on uh, complete no-till and cover crops was above that point, above a quarter ton. So it's challenging at best, but I think that we need to really work on well, it really depends. I'll say it, it, it's true anywhere you are. I think it'll be easier to get more traction in the areas of the United States that are a little bit tougher uh, from climate. A quarter inch of topsoil to them is everything. That may be all they have. Here, if you waste another inch, does it matter? I'm being facetious on that, but yeah, Neil. And that struck me as had the potential to be a real game changer in terms of, you know, 
operators and, and the landowners in terms of being able to actually visualize, as well as farm. Has that been your experience, though? I mean, are people, you know, are they that interested by it? Are they, has it really changed how people think about how they're managing those lands when they see those colored maps that, oh my God, I'm losing that much soil out here? Yes and no. It's information only, that's it. It doesn't tell them what to do. It's like a soil test. You go out and you test your soil. Why? Because you want to know the nutrients in it. Now you make a decision of what you want to apply for nutrients based on economics, crops are going to grow, et cetera, right? So I think soil calculator is the same thing. It's information only. Until we tie that into a bigger picture, which is being worked on, where you can now start looking at, OK, here's my farm. Here's the sediment leaving it. What if I change management? What if I change rotation? What if I put in structures? And now we can start, do, we're, we're on the cusp of that. So now we can start working with farmers and saying, OK, so you put in a buffer strip along the stream. OK, it helps water quality. What's it do to soil quality? Uh, unfortunately, not much. What about cost? Well, it's a little expensive because you're taking out some of that best land. So then what if you put in structures? Well, good for water quality, not so good for soil health. And so it's the bars, right? Most people really don't understand that aspect of what they're getting. Some of the polls we do with, cons with farmers are, what is stopping you from doing more conservation? The largest factor is, I don't know the biggest bang for my buck. Jim. Stan, in, in looking at those fields, and I'll just go back to the one you showed with the cornfield, and you saw the, the, the hillside or even the, the caps in northern Iowa, the erodible knobs. Mm -hmm. So what do we do with those on a field scale? You know, those soils are not as productive. I can't apply more fertilizer. I can't get those soils to produce. What do I do with those at the field scale? Because going back to Neil's comment about leasing and leases and whatever, I may be paying the same per acre rent for every acre in that field, but it's not the same. So Jim, what would you do if they were an employee? Who, the soil or what? The acre. The acre is an employee. Put it in that perspective. You have employees, and let's say that they're all in the same position, all paid the same. Some are very productive. Some are not very productive. What do you do with those that are not very productive? You manage them differently, or you get rid of them. Or you continue and you just take a beating, right? I mean, those are really your choices. So you can either just take the beating, you can manage them differently. So now you can start saying, well, wow, if I'm going to seed cover crops, maybe that thinner area is where I seed the cover crops. Or maybe you put in some small grains or something else. They're probably not producing right now. They're probably not paying their way anyway. So why not put some small grains in there, maybe some hay, something a little different. Or maybe you retire. Or maybe you put them in CRP. To be honest, some of those areas, if you just stop farming them, on your farm you would make more money. And I agree with you. I mean, I'll go back to my question on the lease thing. You know, I, I need the landowner to work with me in this situation because they, they want to release me the whole field. And they want to charge me the same for acre rent. But can I rent it and, and my returns? And I can't spread my returns across acres. I mean, it, it's got to be a two-way thing. So all that has to be figured into the process. Fully agree. That's a good question and a good point. How do we make the leases more flexible in terms of for the actual tillable acres that people are renting. Unfortunately, part of having, or I had a tight schedule <laughs> is that we have a tight schedule. And so we're at the end of this the first time around. You can come here later for a second dose uh, after lunch if you want to. But otherwise, we're going to move on now. You've got five minutes to move to the next room. And let's thank you.